Hi, I'm Spencer. I'm a .NET consultant and a Microsoft MVP, and this is Intro to C Sharp and .NET. I made this course because I believe that .NET is the absolute best platform for making web apps. In this course, we go through the .NET ecosystem, a lot of the tooling that you'll use in your .NET journey, as well as a deep dive into the fundamentals of C Sharp. We'll also talk about some of the features of the .NET Core libraries. Take this knowledge and go build awesome web apps with C Sharp and .NET. Let's talk about the const keyword for a second. Um, const, again, is similar but different than if you're coming from JavaScript. Const is used every, I, const is my var when I'm writing JavaScript. I use const, const and let, um, because var in JavaScript has problems. In C Sharp, it does not have any of the problems that it has, but there is a const keyword. Uh, and this is a little bit confusing because const is really a compiler time kind of like static variable, and it really is only good for using value types. You cannot set like a, a reference type to a const. You would use a static instead, which we'll get into. But this is what it looks like. Um, so this is something that you can declare in a specific scope. So in this case, I've declared it in the main method scope. You don't have to put it there. You can also put it at class scope um, for something that would be uh, used among multiple multiple different things that might access this this uh, this variable. So um, const is different in JavaScript in that you, t like I said, you don't assign anything but integers and strings uh, or, you know, floats, boolean. Those are the kinds of things that you would assign to a const. Um, it wouldn't be used in most of your programming. Uh, most of the time you're going to be using var or declaring the variable with the, uh, with the type like that. Variables uh, fall out of scope. So that's a really important thing to say. So let's show an example of a, of a, a quick example of a, an if statement. So if this value is true, then we want to execute this number of code, this, this particular piece of code. So I'm going to move my number of times variable declaration there to show that if I try to access it outside of scope, I can't do it because variables are invariably scoped inside of the curly braces in which they live. There's also, uh, when we talk about visibility more, uh, we'll talk about variables declared in like at the class level declared with different types of visibility. In order for this to be accessible outside of program, for instance, this would need to be public. But we'll get into that more as we talk about accessibility mod modifiers. Is, um, is var inherently like a uh, broader scope, or I forget what it's called, uh, in the way that it is in JavaScript? No, that is a great question. So all variables in C Sharp have a, so I believe what you're kind of asking about is the, the thing called hoisting, or right, where the, the var statement in JavaScript gets moved, essentially, if you declared this as a var, you'd be able to access this in JavaScript outside of its scope. C Sharp has none of that. All variables fall out of scope when you remove, when you go out of block. And it could be a block like this. Uh, it could be inside of a method, a block inside of a method. It could be a block inside of a class, but it doesn't have the same kind of um, assignment semantics and memory implications that JavaScript does. Really great question. That's a really great question, a really important point. Um, because like I said, var is totally different. It, it's obviously very similar because you're declaring variables with it, but it's totally different in practice. Great question. Is then an analogous way of hoisting it to use the public word? Yeah, I, I kind of, yeah. So like if you wanted to expose it um, to a broader scope, um, this would be kind of the way to do that, but it wouldn't put it in like, if you had a separate class declaration, you couldn't, you couldn't just implicitly access this max score unless you used its uh, fully qual what we call the fully qualified name. So you'd be able to um, void test method. You can't just go up here and because this is declared as const in, in, in a high level scope, you can't just say uh, max score and expect to be able to access it. It doesn't have any of that, but you can access it because it's declared as public. You could go public or uh, sorry, program dot max score and access the variable that way. So it doesn't have the same, nearly the same poor implications as it does in JavaScript. So this is a quote that I use all the time. A large fraction of the flaws in software development are due to programmers not fully understanding their states 
all possible states their code, code may execute in. So exceptions are errors that are thrown by the runtime, and they can be thrown for any number of reasons. They can be thrown by your own code. They can be thrown by code written by Microsoft. They could be uh, they could be thrown um, as part of uh, the code inside of a framework. So exceptions are really an important part of development, uh, especially in C sharp, and understanding what they are and how to predict them and how to handle them is really important. So the thing that we do uh, to control them, we're going to introduce a different control flow type, which is, I'm going to delete this, close that, and I am going to write out what's called a try catch. So let's break down what this statement is doing. So the try catch, the try is basically I am executing code that I think may throw an exception. The catch is where the code that will execute that will actually do that will actually execute if an exception is caught. So let me demonstrate that. So I mentioned the date time dot parse method earlier. So if we give it just a random string, what's going to happen? It's probably going to throw an exception, right? And I can see that actually. If you go here, you can hover over it. Uh, it will tell you the kinds of exceptions that it will throw. It will tell you if the argument is null, it will throw the argument null exception. So if you give it a null string, uh, or if you give it an invalid string, a format exception will be thrown. So we can see that here. I will console.write line, something went wrong. Boom. And then we will control shift tilde dot net run. And then we see that something went wrong. It's because at this point, we got an exception. And let me show you kind of what that looks like. I'm going to run this with the debugger, which I haven't done yet. So I've put what's down, what's called a breakpoint. And essentially, I want to say that if this part of the execution, if the if this uh, line is going to be executed, then I want you to stop there. But it has to be run in debug mode. And debug mode has a performance penalty associated with it. It, run, it takes a lot of resources to run debug, comparatively speaking. So you can see that we've actually stopped at this point, we've hit the breakpoint, we caught the exception, and you can see that we, if we hover over the exception, which is something that I do frequently, this is something that I love using my tooling for, right? You can see that the type of exception that's thrown, you can get some more information about it. I really wanted to just do this to demonstrate uh, that once an error hits here, it will fall down to here and catch the, and do what's called catch the exception. So now we could do something with it. We can recover gracefully we could uh, ask the user to input something else, right? There's a lot of things we can do. It really depends on, the, on what we're looking for. Now, the base class, all exceptions are of this base class, which is system.exception. And there are no exceptions to that rule. All things, all errors that are thrown are, exception, are of the exception class. They're of the exact exception type. But you can, if you want to, catch uh, multiple types of exceptions, and you can also catch more derived types, as we call them. So let's say we wanted to catch uh, the argument null exception, right? Because that's one of the two exceptions that gets handled here. So let's watch what happens when we do that. We have a breakpoint, we're running it in debug mode, and instead of going down here, we didn't have the, the exception be caught. So the CLR in our debugger rightfully told us, hey, this, at this line of code, this exception was thrown, so what do you want to do? So I'm just going to keep going, and it's just going to crash the program. And that's because I've chosen to only catch an argument, an argument null exception here at this line. But if I copy-paste this, I can actually catch multiple kinds of exceptions. As you can see, the compiler tells me that I'm already, I'm already catching this, so I don't need to do anything with it, or I can't do anything with it. This code won't compile. But I can catch this exception here now, and if I put my breakpoint here, and I put my breakpoint here, I'll debug the project, and you can see that it skips over because the, the exception that's thrown is very clearly a format exception, not an argument null exception. Sometimes there are situations where you have classes that maybe they're in a separate library, maybe they're in a NuGet package, and you're not gonna, you don't want to decompile the source code or or build it yourself. You just want to use the package as it was intended, and maybe add a few in extra behaviors or uh, things to it that you just want to do. Maybe it's something that doesn't a method that doesn't quite fit uh, inside of another class, 
right? So you want to add that method, but it really kind of doesn't fit in with the rest of the class. It's kind of just kind of stands alone, especially in the context of maybe it's useful in this library, but it's not useful. And it's useful in this ASP.NET Core application, but it's not useful uh, in this WinForms app. So string is a good example. Um, of that. String is a sealed class, it means you cannot inherit from it, thank goodness. <laughs> you And it's fundamental to the language, but you can't extend it very much, which is fine, but maybe not ideal for a given use case. You may find that you want to do things with the string that are maybe specific to your use case, but do it in a way that's convenient for developers. So extension methods are kind of the magic that kind of makes that possible. So an extension method allows you to essentially add behavior to an existing thing without actually extending that thing. Let me show you what that looks like. Let's take, for example, the string class, as we already have. Uh, and maybe we want to define a method that basically says is palindrome. Um, maybe we're doing some kind of riddle application or some kind of puzzle application. And knowing if a string is a palindrome is very useful in that context, but not really in the context of the real world you can have this string extensions class that essentially defines a static. So this is a static class. It has only behaviors. It does not have properties. And it only has behaviors that can affect other things, right? There's no instances of this class. You just use it to hold methods, essentially, or properties uh, that other things can use. And then you have this static method called is palindrome, and you want it to operate on strings. Let's copy this over to our code remove this and then paste this in. Perfect. Okay. We could very easily go up to this and say uh, var ma'am. And then we could easily say string extensions because that's the name of the class that we've defined our method in is palindrome and say ma'am, right? And then we can put it out to console and see the value is palindrome. Boom. Open our terminal, .NET run, and see that it is indeed a palindrome. In other words, a word that is spelled the same way forwards as backwards. But we do this a lot. We don't want to call string extensions everywhere. And we want developers to be happy with us. We're going to extend this thing. We just want this to kind of behave as it's, if it's an extension of the string class, even though it's there. Check this out. If I go mam dot is palindrome, I now have access to that method as if it was on the class. So you notice that if I hover over it, it says extension. And that's because it is still a static method. It is not, it does not belong to the string class in any way. Uh, but it behaves as though it is inside of the editor. And that's because we've defined it as an extension method. What's the magic that makes that happen? It's this keyword right here. This keyword, literally this keyword. The this keyword is the thing that, that defines this, the thing that makes this an extension method. So this is just basically a marker to say, hey, language, I want you to, or really a uh, compiler, I want you to be able to interpret uh, uses of this is palindrome method as if it were on the actual instance of a string. The moment we delete this, we come down here and we can see that there's no, it doesn't have a definition for is palindrome and no extension method, except the first argument of type string could be found. Are you missing a, a using or a directive or an assembly reference? So as soon as we took that out, we no longer have as, as an extension method. Now, again, when we put it back, we don't get the compiler error. Again, we're not actually extending the string class. It's kind of a pattern called a mix-in, and uh, this is common in JavaScript, where you just add kind of behaviors. But it's a lot easier to add behaviors in JavaScript that, to existing things than it is in C Sharp. So in that, we can define additional behaviors. We can even treat them like a, like a little property. Um, it's a method, but you know it's open parens, close parens. It kind of behaves the same way. So it's our way of extending the string class, not actually extending the string class.